I'm Jason Kessler. I work for CDK Global, a company in Seattle that does uh, uh, full stack software for auto retail. And this is a talk that has nothing to do with the auto industry. It's uh, about an NLP package for text visualization uh, for Python. It's called Scatter Text. And just to get it out of the way, this is the kind of thing the package produces. It's a comparison of how Democrats and Republicans spoke in the 2012 political convention. So it's, it's four years ago, or, so it's uh, the, the 2016 political convention speeches. Um, or sorry, 2012, four years ago. Uh, it's a little bit less heated than, than current politics now. And we'll sort of use this as a running example, but you'll get an idea of, of what the colors mean, what the axes mean, uh, why there are these funny strings on the chart, what those two columns are uh, to the right. And before we get started, if you have your laptop out, feel free to follow along with this talk. If you go to this bit.ly link, I'll be showing that throughout the presentation. So the first part of the talk will be you know, five or 10 minutes. And then if you also want to install this package in another one that we'll be using, if you type pip3 or just pip, install scatter text and age from name. Uh, they're optimized for Python 3, but they should probably work in Python 2. Uh, so Scatter text is a way to visualize how different groups speak differently. We can see how they speak differently in general, like that, that chart right there, and then in topic-specific ways. So how do Democrats and Republicans talk differently about the word jobs? And we'll get into uh, word vectors and word representations there. And then we'll look at the intersection of different group types. So how do uh, the gender and party of the speaker intersect? Uh, so we'll look at some fun case studies about similar uh, sociolinguistic and sort of computational social science studies. And the rest will consist of a bunch of code examples. And it should be a tutorial to, to get you up and running on how to use scatter text. Uh, so there's a lot of the Python ecosystem that's involved in this, Spacey, GenSim, um, a lesson in a library called Empath, uh, which is pretty cool, and also the Age from Name library. And we make heavy use of uh, pandas and NumPy. So this should be a good toolkit for computational social science and, and really any kind of text exploration. So the first case study we'll talk about was from OKCupid. This is uh, 2010, I think. And it's which words and phrases statistically distinguish different ethnic groups and genders. And the source was this massive amount of dating profiles from OKCupid. So for example, this one lady uh, talks about hobos and almond butter, another Bikram yoga, a third 100 years of solitude. You know, Maybe these uh, different things they talk about correlate to their genders or, or their um, ethnic heritage. Uh, so I'll, of course, start off by picking on myself. So here are words and phrases that distinguish white men like in 2010. So you can see like Tom Clancy, Van Halen, golfing, you know, Ghostbusters. It, it already kind of sounds like, like a, a set of like very specific movie genres. The Big Lebowski, I guess Ghostbusters was still the, uh, the original sort of pre-remake. Um, and like, you know, hunting and fishing, you know, sports, apocalypse now building things, so you know, sweaty guitar rock, bro and bro comedies, things with engines and dystopia. So Christian Rutter, who uh, was the chief data scientist at OkCupid, sort of had this you know, small uh, sort of jokey passage to go along with the word clouds. Uh, so one of the really interesting ones is words and phrases that distinguish Latin men. And, and when I looked at this, um, I wasn't familiar with a lot of these categories. And, and of course, uh, you know, this, this segment contains lots of other segments, you know, a ton of different nationalities, uh, Cuban, Dominican, uh, Colombian, et cetera. But um, also, like, I had to Google what reggaeton was. Uh, this sort of speaks to the a need for diversity among data scientists, frankly. Um, but also, there were things that were like really, really surprising that, that I hadn't thought about before. A big emphasis on the armed forces, on military, on like boxing and UFC, but also, you know, I'm a funny dude, very funny, uh, outgoing and funny, you know, saying that they're funny. So it, it ends with a joke. Basically, if a Latin dude tells you a joke, you should laugh. Um, so another study uh, that was a little bit more recent was done on thousands of really tens of thousands of, fa of Facebook statuses that were collected by psychologists at uh, UPenn. And Lyle Unger was uh, the head of the study. And he presented this at uh, his AAAI tutorial in 2013, actually just in, in Bellevue. 
And he put a lot of thought into how to make word clouds to visualize how different categories uh, differed. So here, these are words uh, and phrases that are characteristic of women in Facebook statuses. So these are things like shopping, excited, uh, the heart. And then you can see uh, the color is the relative frequency and the size of the words are the correlation strengths. Topics that correlated with gender are sort of put out in sort of the spokes outside of it. And the good thing about word clouds is they force you to hunt for the most impactful terms. Uh, so you end up looking at the long tail in the process. And you can compactly represent a lot of words. So like UG might have been, if you rank this list, UG might have been you know, rank number 50 or something. But you'd still, um, but now you still see it by the heart emoji, the, the heart emoticon, which is highly correlated. Um, but word clouds go uh, can go bad. So they were famously called by Jeffrey Zeldman or tag clouds, the mullets of the internet, back in in 2005. So that's like uh, 12 years ago. Uh, and longer phrases become a lot more prominent just because they're longer, because the size of the text in a word cloud, uh, the size of, of the phrase, tends to indicate its prominence. Also, the ranking is unclear. Like, you don't know whether which is he or the F word is bigger. And then also, it's, it's confusing in terms of color and size. Does the color indicate higher frequency or that it's um, more correlated? So word clouds have some problems. Uh, so. Actually, Christian Rutter, who had made the first set of word clouds, uh, wrote this book called uh, Dataclasm in 2014, where he proposed this alternative formulation. And instead of word clouds for finding words and phrases that were associated with a particular category, you could just plot the word frequencies. Uh, so on the y-axis, you'd see how um, words ranked with uh, white men. So the word the is very high, but also on the y-axis, you'd see the x-axis, you'd see how words ranked with everyone else. So the word the comes in the upper right-hand corner and also a bunch of stop words. But you have the word snowmobiling falling directly on the y-axis. So only white men talked about snowmobiling, nobody else. On the other hand, uh, this was, I think, pre, I, well, I guess this was post-Gangnam style, but no white man talked about K-pop in the, uh, the sample of Facebook statuses. But it, it ranked above, above median with everyone else. Uh, so you can sort of see how close, if like the word fish has a very, very low distance to the upper left-hand corner. So you could say that that's highly correlated with, with white men. It's a very, very simple metric. And K-pop is a really big distance. So you say that wouldn't be, that would be, uh, have a low correlation. And really what happens is the smaller, the smaller the distance from the top left, the higher the association with white men. It's a very good, um, very intuitive way of finding how words correlate. It might not be the best metric, but it's a very intuitive one. Uh, so we can actually see, and this is, this is the, the picture that he drew of the, all of the, the profiles that he collected. The word my blue eyes is this huge outlier in terms of how they correlated with white men. And that was, that was the most correlated expression. I don't know if this actually refers to real data. It would be very interesting to see how he did this chart. So let's. Uh, Go now to a demo. So if you're following along, you can just um, go to this bit.ly link, uh, pi data scatter text one. Uh, so I'll just give everyone a second to do that right now. Um, OK, the second is over. Um, <laughs> Uh, does that, uh, anyone still need a little bit more time? OK, great. So this is the introduction to scatter text. Um, so you can install scatter text through, through pip. And then if you just do import scatter text as st, that's the convention for referring to scatter text. Uh, I also make heavy use of spacey uh, to do document parsing. And I just call this NLP equals spacey.en.english. If you don't want to install spacey or download the big uh, language model for English, uh, you can just do NLP uh, equals just a regex tokenizer and sentence segmenter, which, which doesn't work very well, but, but is a lot faster and, and less efficient. Uh, again, does anyone, anyone need the, the bit.ly link again? Or? OK. Great. So what you can do is uh, I've included the uh, 2012 political convention data set. 
in uh, scatter tech. So uh, line three here is just pulling this. And then we can see that this gives you a pandas data frame. The first entry, oh, yes? You still have the oh, oh, you still have that. Oh, no. Um, Thank you. OK, sorry about that. Um, thank you for, for saying something. So right, you import scatter text as ST. And then uh, here, I'm just using NLP as a, uh, um, for, the, for the spacey English parser. So we can grab the 2012 convention data set. And then we can see, we can look at the first line of it and see that it lists the party uh, of the speaker, the name of the speaker, the first and last name of the speaker, and the text of the speech. Uh, so here, this, is, uh, this was Obama's keynote speech, or his, his acceptance speech for the, the 2012 convention. And we can see that in the conventions, Democrats uh, spoke a whole lot more, at least made more speeches, 123 speeches, to Republican 66. We can now turn this into a scatter text corpus object through this corpus from parse document factory, where we specify which category we're interested in the party. And um, we've parsed the corpus here. And then we've put uh, the spacey documents, the parse documents, into this uh, parsed column. So let's take a look at um, this metric called scale f-score before we look at the charts. This is how we color the terms in the chart. Uh, there are a lot of ways of finding how terms are associated. We already looked at the corner score. Now let's look at this, this novel technique called scaled F-score. The intuition is that associated terms with a particular category have this high category-specific precision and recall. So if you just made a classifier, does this document contain this term or not, you could compute the precision and recall of that classifier. And the F-score is the harmonic mean of the precision and recall. And sort of there are no hyperparameters here except um, how do you ultimately scale the precision recall? And then how do you compute the F-score, uh, the beta parameter? So what we can do is we can see if we just naively apply this, we can get this pandas data frame where it's indexed on terms that occur in the corpus, how many times they're used by Democrats, by Republicans. And then we can look at the relative precision. So Democrats are a little bit more common where they spoke slightly more words. So even the word the has um, an above 50% precision for Democrats. Uh, but, and the recall is, is 2%. So this is, it was used um, essentially in 2% in of all, uh, spoken 2% of all times. All, about 2% of all words spoken were the word the. So it has a very high scale at F-score just because the recall is, is um, not super low. So this doesn't really work. And these are ranked by F-score. The solution here is we take the, uh, the normal CDF of the precision and recall scores, and that will make them fall between, both make them fall also between 0 and 1, but it'll kind of scale and standardize, standardize the scores, sort of. So the mean of the scores will be uh, 0.5. So you'll have, um, you'll, you'll be able to uh, similarly scale both the precision and recall. And what we see is once we apply this, and then we, again, take the harmonic mean of the, the scaled, uh, the normalized precision and recall, we can see the word middle class comes up as the most correlated term for Democrats. And it was used 108, 148 times by Democrats and 18 times by Republican. The word auto uh, occurs 37 times by Democrats, but zero times by Republicans. So it's doing something a little bit different than the, for example, the log odds ratio, which is another very popular technique. Um, if we look at this for corner score, corner score uh, is much more strict in terms of the precision of these terms. And it just favors terms that have precisions of 100%. So we can see, again, the top 10 Democratic terms, the top 10 Republican terms. Republicans talked about unemployment. We can do better, uh, liberty government. Then he also talked about odd things like the Olympics, since Romney had run the Salt Lake City Olympics. So let's go ahead and see how we can get to these charts. So sort of the naive way of creating one of these charts is you can go ahead and just rank the terms based on their raw frequencies. And this chart is almost entirely dominated by, uh, by stop words. Now, 
there are some researchers like James Pennebaker and UT Austin who think stop words are reveal some some sort of very important mental states. Like you use I much more if you're lying than if you're not lying or talking to a superior. Women use more personal pronouns, things like that. But but for the most part, this doesn't allow us to do a particularly good content analysis of the uh, um, of the corpus. Now, if instead we scale by the log frequency, we get something that looks a little bit better. And actually, the corner scores of these um, of both categories work pretty well. Uh, so middle class auto fare doing a log scale uh, just to, to sort of normalize for the Ziffian distribution, to sort of normalize for that. But we still get a whole lot of white space in the chart. Uh, we can only label part of the points. And stop words still take up a, a big chunk of it. So instead of ranking terms by raw frequencies, we can rank terms based on their percentile, uh, just based on their, their ranks. And the wonderful thing about this is that the stop words are essentially minimized into the far upper right-hand corner, just like they were on the rudder diagram. And then this spreads out throughout the entire chart. The issue here is that, for example, uh, on this point right here, there could be, uh, actually, and if you click on these points, they'll, uh, they'll show context, but right over here, there could be hundreds of words that are stacked on top of that point. And all of them, none of them are accessible because we can only mouse over the first one in this interface. Uh, by the way, these charts are done in D3. There is a custom uh, uh, point labeling algorithm that's created using a, a package called Cozy that was developed at UW to automatically, uh, that, that easily that makes it easy to write an algorithm to find uh, places to put labels that don't overlap anything else. So one solution to this, this problem, the stacking problem, is you can just jitter the points. So that way we can uh, randomly add some small quantity to each of the points and then spread them out. The issue with doing that is the distance to the upper left-hand or lower right-hand corner is really important. And especially when you get up here into sort of the higher frequency terms, you just get confetti. You get um, words that are out of order, that are very difficult to read. And plus, it just kind of messes around. These are always listed by the uh, the scaled F scores, you can get um, like the word cars comes up here, and, and this is ranked a little bit too highly for Democrats. So you can mess up your, uh, your corner score, and especially visually, that's very important. So the, the preferred solution took me a little while to come up with this, but you just break ties. Um, you don't jitter, but you break ties alphabetically. What this does is you'll see these like little sequences of terms that all have the same frequency and that are all just laid atop each other because you're breaking ties alphabetically. Uh, so here you have uh, bond and bond came in two wars. So these are in alphabetical order sort of for these exact frequencies. So we can also do a, a couple more types of visualization with scatter attack. So we can use this, this package to visualize the differences between different um, term-finding algorithms. So for example, using L2 penalized logistic regression uh, is, is, tends to be a preferred way of, of looking at term importance. Uh, so here we can just rank the terms instead of by their corner score or by their regression coefficients. And what we can see is uh, using uh, a pretty, uh, some fairly aggressive parameters with um, uh, L2 penalized logistic regression, a, a high C parameter, uh, we can see that a lot of stop words do get ranked very highly here. So like for, apostrophe s, and and of are good indicators of a speaker being Republican, which, which doesn't make a lot of sense intuitively. So right now, the, the recommendation here is not to use um, L2 penalized logistic regression for finding terms that are associated. They're also other issues that you can potentially get some balancing out effects. So we can see how this compares to scaled F-score, which looks pretty different. So here the y-axis is scaled F-score. Again, the, the x-axis here is the log frequency ranks. Uh, so 
scaled F score tends to uh, like terms that are not incredibly unfrequent, but that aren't super frequent. So the stop words are ranked somewhat highly, like the word Jill over here is actually ranked lower than, than the in terms of association with Democrats. But we can sort of get the middle of the uh, the middle of the, the frequencies are ranked pretty highly. So we can get interesting semantic information um, based in, in this range of frequencies. And then we can also compare this to things like um, a log odds ratio, with a, um, which has been sort of very popular with a, uh, an uninformative prior, where here this really favors terms that never occur in either category and, and shrinks everything else. And then also we can look at corner score, which says something similar but is even more aggressive in, in how it regularizes terms. OK, great. So let's um, take a break from pure word frequencies and let's look at something else. So let's look at gender discriminating terms. And we'll take a step back. So we'll just set this up just the same way we did earlier. And let's look at this package called age from name. Uh, what this does is this will tell you um, what someone's age is, but also based on social security data of, of how many people had a particular first name in a given year and life expectancy data, it will impute the probability that someone's, uh, if someone's name is Kelsey, uh, what's the probability they're male? So right now, if someone's name was Kelsey, they'd, you'd have a 3% chance of being male. But if you adjust their minimum age, and say, OK, they're at least 70 years old, then there's, they're, 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 then there's an 83% chance they're male. Now, at any given year, you can see in 1930, there was like a 100% chance that Kelsey would be a man. But now, in 20, at least in 2015, the last date that I checked, there's a 3% chance that Kelsey will be a man. So you can see how names change over time. So it's important if you want to. Uh, impute someone's gender from their name, it, it helps to know their age. It also helps to know the date of the, the document. So now let's go ahead and let's take the convention data set and we'll assign speakers a gender. We'll just assume that they're making the wild assumption they're at least 35 years old. And we'll say they're male if uh, there's at least a 90% probability they're male, and they're female if there's less than a 10% probability they're, they're male. So we can't tell with Barack, it probably wasn't a very frequent name uh, when he was born, uh, but Michelle is definitely female and Richard is definitely male. And we can get all but 19 speakers. So this, this is pretty good. And now we can see the language use in these conventions uh, that differ between genders. And, and this is kind of cool. So we can see here that women uh, that female speakers talked a lot about health care, and particularly health coverage. Uh, they talked about their daughters, uh, planned as in Planned Parenthood, uh, so level the playing field. And then these also sort of tend to correspond with uh, democratic talking points, but these were, we'll, we'll sort of see how these, uh, these intersect with gender. But the word ladies, so these very gender terms, ladies, mom, uh, also, birth control, first lady, daughters. For men, it was there was a lot of rhetoric and policy. So the word yet, uh, you know, trillion dollars of debt, Bain Consulting talking about Israel is mostly Democrats talking about Israel. The private sector, confidence, the poor, energy policy, private equity. So it sort of it tells you something about how the parties position their speeches where the female speakers are speaking directly toward uh, toward female voters potentially and now we can even see how gender and party intersect so we can graph down here how the scaled f scores differ on the y axis we can see the scaled f score of uh, how democratic a word is, and the y-axis how female a word is. So in the lower left-hand corner, you can see Republican words that were characteristically spoken by men. So these were unemployment, government, church, trillion, debt, Bain as in Bain Capital, like the dollar sign. And then in the upper right-hand corner, we can see democratic words that were spoken uh, 
by women predominantly. So we have the word women and uh, woman. And this is also sort of an interesting reason why I don't stop list, because if you see the same word appearing both times with the same morphology, then that's, that's sort of added evidence that it's, it's valid. Uh, and then also the word am, which is kind of an interesting stop word that, that got in here. Uh, and then again, you can see more, um, actually, I think am may have been neutral. But uh, so women was, was highly associated with Democrats, women less so, also insurance. And the word vote was very interesting, that this was um, very characteristic of Democratic women. And then Republican women, you have success, and they really like Ronald Reagan. Um, <laughs> and then also talking about Ann Romney. And then one tie-in that we have, there's um, a recently released package. It was um, a, a Kai paper in 2016 that creates uh, essentially crowdsourced topic models that correspond to an emotion or a particular topic that occurred in language around 2016. It's a very interesting paper, and I suggest that you download this, this package, which is just called Empath, and you can find it in, in the, uh, the slides, or, or in the, uh, the tutorial. But you can see one of the interesting things was, so women talked about things that were feminine, they talked about dance. Um, also, obviously, you have this big like medical emergency and health issue, also children and family. While men talked about jobs, blue collar jobs and white collar jobs, technology and journalism and programming, and also the poor, which is very interesting. So let's, uh, let's look at how this intersects with word vectors and with, with deep learning, which has been very popular at this conference. If you want to call word to vec deep learning, it's, there's just a hidden layer. So again, we, we load the convention set just as we normally do. And for the first example, we can use GenSim to train a word to vec model. And if you've ever trained a word to vec model in GenSim before, you know there's quite a bit of hyperparameter tuning. And there's a little bit of a dark art to training these things if you don't have a gargantuan amount of data. So I, I won't go into that, but there's a lot of literature on, on how to best train. Uh, uh, word representations. But we can see intuitively that this model performs pretty well. So taxes, uh, affordable cuts, um, prescription, fair tax, opportunities, not great. We can see how this relates to, say, Obama. Oh, no, and I, actually, let's not. <laughs> but so for example, we can look at a particular target term. So I, I have the term jobs here, and we can color words that are associated with one category or another. These are using penalized log odds ratio uh, just to see words that have a p-value of less than uh, 0.05 that are associated with Democrats or Republicans. Those are, oh yes? Oh, oh thank you. Those are, those are colored. And uh, Democrats are colored blue, Republicans are, are colored red. And then we look at the word similarity scores between the word jobs and all the colored terms. And then we can see how the two parties talked about jobs. So Republic, with Democrats in this model, it was middle class, auto industry, a plan, um, fair. So it wasn't great, job cuts. And then Republicans, success in talking about job killing regulations. Another way of doing this, instead of training bespoke topic models, is it's built into scatter text where you can just use spaces, uh, common crawl, uh, spaces, common crawl word vectors, which, uh, which tend to work much better for this application. So you can see like the word workers uh, occur, is highly associated with Democrats as is companies. So here you can see it's really kind of labor versus business are how Democrats and Republicans talk about jobs differently. So job creators versus workers. Uh, is, is a pretty interesting result and is, is intuitively plausible. And that is it for the presentation. So thank you uh, very much. And are there any questions? Thanks a lot. Um, 
I was curious, so I have two questions. Um, the first one is I noticed some multi-word expressions in, in these plots. I was uh -huh. curious how you, how you treated those as single uh, tokens. OK, so I used just the PMI trick okay. uh, to, to find multi-word expressions. Cool. I just looked at pygrams and okay, treated cool. them just like everything else. Yeah. And so you include a, um, a sample corpus with scatter text, and That's that includes right. like the pre-processed. Uh, yeah, that just includes like a basically a CSV or, or a data frame okay. uh, just of the data that I showed. Cool. Uh, and so my other question was about uh, scaled F-score. And I was wondering if you, if you could just talk about that a little bit more, oh, like sure. the motivation, and, and maybe point to some literature. Uh, yeah, so there is no literature. This this is the literature for scaled F-score. OK. Um, so the motivation is that a lot of these other so multivariate scores like um, logistic regression tend to have these weird balancing out things where you'll have words that aren't really correlated or there's some relation, there's some multicollinearity and you'll get funny weights. So I was looking at unigram scores. And uh, looking at, so what was very popular is log odds with an informative prior um, that requires you to pick a specific background corpus to balance out against. So scaled F score tends to be hyperparameter free and it just doesn't ape um, log odds ratio, which is the problem with a lot of these. Uh, just looking at your examples in particular, it seems like a lot of things would be further differentiated if you could look at n-grams. For example, jobs was differentiated. Well, probably good jobs mm -hmm. has a very different party affiliation than job creators or free market versus free press or something like that. Um, yeah. So a lot of the, uh, but I do see in some cases you have some short phrases that are several words. How do you decide where to pull off the short phrases versus the individual words. So we just yeah. used, actually, the, an ACL reviewer uh, said the exact same thing. So if you're going to ACL in Vancouver, this will be a demo uh, where you can, can muck around with this. But, but the idea is it's just the same answer that we used. It was just bigrams for, in order to speed up the computation. And then I just looked at a PMI filter to see which bigrams looked like they were statistically improbable. But yes, I think it would benefit from more n-grams if there was more computation time. And also, it's harder to label longer expressions on the chart. So uh, most of the, your reasoning are based on a word or a shorter phrase. Uh -huh. uh, any attempt to build a model for understanding a sentence? Uh, for studying a sentence? Yeah, to understand a sentence. Uh, so I think. You could conceivably use this to, um, to plot, uh, say, if, if you had a probability that a sentence was generated by a particular corpus, or if you train language models on uh, both categories, you could see the probability that this sentence was generated by this category, and then plot those sentences in a similar fashion. But I hadn't thought about that. It's an interesting question. Um, uh, so, well, how would you recommend using scatter text if you're uh, uh, plotting something with more than two categories? So that's a good question. So if you see the intersection between gender and political party, there you can do, um, well, I guess, like, like two sets of categories. Otherwise, you can just do a bunch of one versus all plots. It's not very elegant. I, I have been thinking about ways of, of approaching multiple categories, which are, are a little bit different. But I can talk to you about those offline. Okay, cool. Any other questions? Uh, so you mentioned about P, uh, PMI filter. Like which uh -huh. part of the code is about this? Uh, oh, so there is, so I just included this internally. Uh, the idea of the PMI filter is you just um, try to figure out how probable um, two words are consecutively, and then see what the probability is of that n-gram, and you look at the ratio, uh, the, really the log ratio of those probabilities. But if you see in, um, let's see, I should have this. So I have this PMI filter threshold. This is just looking at uh, two times that uh, log probability. Uh, so if you just Google PMI multi-word expression, you'll see a ton of literature about this. Any more questions? OK, thank you so much. Hey, thank you.